Hi and welcome back. In this video we'll add a few minor modifications to the calculator program that we've been working on recently. And then we will move on and create another GUI program. Let's get started. First of all, let's have our program handle not only integer but also floating point numbers. Before we get to code writing though, does anybody remember what data type we used for floating point numbers in the C language? Right, float. Java has two primitive data types for floating point numbers, float and double. In this video, we'll not be talking about their differences. We'll just use the type double simply because it seems to be more popular of the two floating point types. Now, to make our program handle floating point numbers, we need to change the code so that user input is converted from text into double instead of int. Where in code do we make this change? Because in the previous video, we created a separate method responsible for taking user input, we do not need to modify any method other than get user input. Pretty handy, isn't it? There is one change we need to make outside get user input method though. We need to change data type of the n1 and n2 variables from int to right, double. And then inside get user input method, instead of parsing user input to int, we should parse it to right, also double. To convert or parse text into double, we can use parse double method of the double class. Like this. As a side note, integer and double are classes, and they're also reference type brothers of the primitive int and double. In fact, all eight primitive data types have reference type analogs. Now, in NetBeans, to run a file, in addition to right clicking on it in the projects pane, we can right click here in the code editor and choose Run File. If we now run this program and try to divide a smaller number by a greater number, instead of zero, our program will display the floating point result of the division. Now, if you don't know much about integer and floating point division in programming, I recommend that you refer to the basics of programming with C video series. Now, let's make the result a bit more informative, just because we can. What we're going to do is we're going to display the values of n1 and n2 in the result label. And for this, we're going to use string concatenation that we touched upon in one of the previous videos. Let me show you what I mean. If we now run this program, we will see that when we add two numbers, the numbers as well as the addition operation are displayed in the result label. Two reasons why we're doing this. One, to remind you about string concatenation, and two, to remind you about one detail related to strings and numbers. In Java, when you add a number to a string, the number gets implicitly converted into a string, and then the two strings are concatenated. In other words, we no longer need to use the value of method, and we can further modify this code like this. Please know that the math must be done inside round brackets. Let's do the same for the remaining buttons. and see if it works. And it does. Finally, let's make this program a little prettier. First, our result label seems a bit off, so let's move it slightly to the right to align it vertically with the other labels. Secondly, we don't need the label to say result at the start, so let's delete the text of the label. You can see that the label has shrunk when it lost all the text. While it's fine for this particular program, this might become an issue if you have some other elements below this label. So instead of completely removing its text, let's add just one space. Since our label has shrunk so that we can no longer right click on it, let's right click on the name of the label in the navigator pane. And choose edit text. If we type in a space in the label, we'll see that it has restored its height. Let's now make the text in the label a bit more prominent. 
To do that, make sure you have the label selected and click the button with three dots in the font property. Here. Currently, the font size is set to 13. Let's increase it to, say, 18. And let's run this program. I don't know about you, but to me this looks better. Maybe because I'm old and blind? Just kidding. There's an issue. When we type in a number without a fractional part, the number is displayed with a zero as its fractional part. The zero is called a trailing zero. Also, when the result is too long, it goes outside the form. Fixing these issues is your homework. Try to figure out how to do that. Google if you need. That should be a good practice. And now we're moving on to the next program. This one will not be much more useful than the calculator program, but it will be a good learning example. After all, this is what we're doing here, learning. Let's add a new JFrame form to our GUI package. And name it form B. What this program will do is it will sum up the numbers that we type in this text field and display the result. Looks simple, doesn't it? First, I'd like you to design the form on your own using the form you see on the screen as a reference. So we need two labels, a text field, and a button. One label will give the user instructions. The text field will be used to input the numbers. The button will say add numbers. And the second label will be used to display the result of addition. So we're going to increase its font size and set its text to a space so that it doesn't lose its height. Let's also rename the components to be need. Then make the form unresizable. and centered at launch. Now let's add an event handler for the button and get to code writing. But before we do, let's clean up the code to be tidy. Since we only have one button, we can write all the code in one place inside the button event handler but we're not going to do that for some rather artificial reasons. And the main reason is to practice using various programming techniques. So just like in the previous program, in this one we're going to split the code into two parts. A part that will be responsible for getting user input and converting it into a form more suitable for doing the math. And a part that will actually do the math. So let's declare a method that will be responsible for taking user input. For now, let's make the method void and parameterless. Since user input is provided to a program as a bunch of numbers separated by a space, before we can convert the text into numbers, we need to break it down into parts using a space as a separator. To do that, we can use the split method of the string class. Since the string we need to split is provided in the text field, we need to call the split method using the text of the text field. There are two versions of the split method. One takes only one parameter, the other takes two parameters. We'll be using the first one. Know that the return type of the split method is string array. In other words, the split method takes a string, splits it into pieces using its parameter as a separator, and returns the individual pieces as a string array. 
So to store the return of the split method, we need a string array variable. And since we use a space as a separator, we pass a string consisting of one space to the split method as a parameter. This part using the dot operator on the method call might look confusing, but it's not very much different from comparing the result of a method call with a value, which we did before. What happens here is the getText method returns a string. And since string is a reference data type, we can use the dot operator to access the members of the string class. In this example, we call the split method on the string reference that the getText method returns. If this explanation sounds completely gibberish to you, you might want to refer to the previous videos before proceeding with this one. So we have a string array containing individual pieces that can now be converted into numbers. Let's use floating point numbers, specifically the type double. To do that, we need to try to convert every single element of the pieces array into a double. The first question is, how do we convert every single element of the pieces array? See, if we type only one number, the pieces array will contain only one element. And if we type in four numbers, the array will contain four elements, and so on. For this, we can use a for loop. And the number of iterations will depend on the number of elements stored in the pieces array. The number of elements in an array is called the length of the array. And to access the length of an array, we can use the dot operator. So our for loop will look like this. If you're not familiar with a for loop or using the for loop to traverse arrays, I recommend that you refer to the basics of programming with C video series. So now inside the loop, we can try to convert each element of the pieces array into a double. The next question is, where do we store the numbers that the parse double method will return? We can use another array, but of the type double. The length of the array must be the same as the length of the pieces array, otherwise the program might not work properly. Does anybody remember how to create an array with a certain length? Right, we should use the new operator, like this. So now we can store return values of the parse double method in the numbers array, like this. There's one issue though. It's not super critical, but still. If we type something that cannot be converted into a floating point number, the corresponding element of the numbers array will remain at its default value, which is 0.0. .0. And that's fine for a program since adding 0 will not affect the result of addition. But to be neat and to practice using yet another data type, we will modify getUserInput method to make it completely ignore the strings that cannot be converted to a number. The question is, how do we know how many elements of the pieces array can be converted to a number, and how many cannot? Well, there is a way to find out, but instead we'll take a different approach. Arrays are data collections, and there are several other types of data collections, for example, array list. One of the differences between arrays and array list is that the latter are resizable, meaning while we have to specify the length of the array when creating one, we don't have to do that for an array list. Array lists can expand and contract in size, which makes them somewhat more flexible than arrays. In other words, we will use an array list instead of an array to store the numbers. So let's make respective changes to our code. Array list is a class, meaning we can declare array list variables. Also, array list, just like scanner, is not available by default, so we need to import it to our program. Next, we need to specify the data type that our array list will have to store, which we must do inside a pair of angular brackets, which you can find to the right of the M key on most keyboards. Unlike arrays, array lists in Java can only store reference data types, meaning we cannot use the primitive type double, but we can use its reference analog, like this. Now let's fix the right hand side of this expression. Because array list is a class, we can instantiate it just like any other class. The ArrayList class also has a noParameter constructor, so an ArrayList instantiation can look like this. Let's look at ArrayList declaration and instantiation a bit more closely. This is one of the possible ways to declare an ArrayList variable and instantiate the ArrayList class. Know that these data types must be compatible, or roughly speaking, identical. Now, when the data types are identical, the one on the right doesn't have to be explicit, meaning we can leave the angular brackets on the right blank, like this. 
We can further simplify this code by removing the empty angular brackets, like this. But doing so is not recommended for some technical reasons. Now, since array lists do not have an explicit size at the beginning, we cannot assign values to it just like we do with arrays. Instead, we need to add elements to an array list using the add method, like this. And what we want to add is the converted piece of text. Now, just to check if it works, let's print this array list at the end of getUserInput method. And call the method inside the event handler. As you can see, the non numeric piece was completely ignored. Cool. We can now delete the println method call. So now we have an array list that stores the numbers that were typed in the text field. And we can do the math with them. The question is, where in code do we do the math? We can actually do it directly in the event handler, but for the sake of more programming practice, let's write a separate method for that. Let's set the return type of the method to void and name it just that, do math. Now the do math method needs something to do the math with, doesn't it? What does it need? Right, the numbers. We've got the numbers in getUserInput method. How do we pass them over to the doMath method? How do we pass anything to a method in the first place? Right, we can pass data to a method in the form of a parameter. So let's have our doMath method take an array list of double as a parameter. Method parameters are variables declared inside round brackets that follow the name of the method. And to declare a variable, we need to specify the data type of the variable and the variable name. In our case, we need a variable of the type array list of double. And the name of the variable can be anything, for example, nums. Now, what can we do with this method parameter? A method parameter can be used inside the method as if it were a variable declared inside that method. In other words, we can use the variable nums inside do math method just like any other variable declared inside the method. Now, how do we add up the numbers stored in the array list? Did you say we can use a for loop? If that's what you said, you're absolutely right. Traversing an array list is in fact very similar to traversing an array. Similar, but not identical. Array lists do not have a length parameter. To get the number of elements stored in the array list, we need to call the size method, like this. Now, adding up the numbers stored in an array list is very similar to doing that with arrays, which we did in the programming with C video series. We need a separate variable that will store the result of addition. And since we're adding floating point numbers, the result of addition is also going to be a floating point number. Unlike arrays, however, we cannot access an element stored in an array list using the square brackets. Instead, we have to use the get method of the array list class. Like this. Finally, what do we do with the result of addition? Right, we display it in the result label. Like this. What else do we need to do? We need to call the doMath method inside the event handler. The problem is that the doMath method requires an array list of double as a parameter. It's not going to do anything without it. Where do we get an array list? We have one in getUserInput method, but it's declared inside the method, which makes it invisible outside the method. We could take the same approach as we did in the previous program, but this time let's do it differently. We can have getUserInput return the array list. How? We did something like that in the previous video, but with a type boolean. Does anybody remember? Well, first we need to change its return type from void to right, array list of double, like this. And now we can return the array list at the end of the method, like this.
Finally, we can call getUserInput method inside the doMath method call, like this. If this part seems confusing to you, please look closely. GetUserInput method returns an array list of double. And then that array list is passed to the doMath method as a parameter. And it works pretty much like using the dot operator on a method call that we did earlier in this video. All right, let's run this program to see if it works. seems to be working. And it's working in the following way. When we press the button, the doMath method is called. doMath in turn tells the getUserInput method to get user input, convert it into numbers, and return the numbers as an array list of double. And once getUserInput method completes its task and returns the array list, the doMath method adds up all the numbers stored in the array list and displays the result in result label. In this video, we created another program with graphical user interface. Even though the two programs we've made so far are not extremely useful, I believe making them was a good practice. And this is it for this video. In the next one, we'll talk about the so-called access modifiers and static members. We'll also modify our GUI project to allow the user to navigate between the two programs that we've made. Looking forward to seeing you. Bye-bye.